So welcome to my walk. I'm going to walk through one of the numerous woodlands around Oakhampton just to have a look and see what's going on through the spring season. It's coming to the end of May at the moment and all through lockdown, March and April, I've been wandering around in the woods. It's, it's so nice to have these woods so close to home and um, those of us that live in Oakhampton are really quite fortunate to be able to come out here and have a look around, just enjoy the fresh air and um, I, I, I just thoroughly love living here and this is one of the big parts of why and I'll try and show you a few things that fascinate me as a woodland naturalist really I might describe myself as. So coming along here in May there were some earlier flowers along this bank here which uh, the celandine flowers, the little yellow flowers, some of the early season ones and um, amongst those were the oil beetle which is quite an unusual beetle, the violet oil beetle. So what I'll try and do with this video is stop from time to time and show you a couple of the stills photos that I've taken back over the last couple of months. So I'm afraid it's a bit windy today, which you can probably hear on the microphone. This bank here is covered with wild garlic, that pungent strong smell that um, stays with you on your woodland walk for a few weeks during the springtime. But it's a lovely plant and those of you who are into foraging and making pesto and pizzas and that kind of thing from, from the leaves it's um, lovely but the flowers have just gone over now there aren't many flowers left but you can see the seed heads that, that are developing there you are one seed head the seeds are a beautiful flavor they're really pungent very strong so um, you can just crunch them up in your mouth and get that explosion of flavor i love this old bank here of beech trees too this is such a sort of a dartmoor feature all across the moor you can see these lovely lines of beech trees which um, were historically used as a boundary marker and they stand out all across the, the whole landscape of the moor. So what we'll do is go and look for particular things, um, things that I like to spend hours and hours <laughs> getting a bit obsessed about. First of all, where I'm going is to look at one particular tree which is just in the hedgerow along here. So back on this old hedge bank then, the, the Welsh poppies have been particularly good this year. There's a last couple of them there. There's something that's native to the southwest of England and Wales. Another one of my favourites. And there's another remnant of the wild garlic just along the side of this meadow here. It's a lovely little meadow. It's not often grazed, but when it is, it gives the opportunity to take a lot of the grasses off and increase the, the diversity of the wild flowers that you might find. But the thing I've come here to look at at the moment is this particular tree. So you can see this tree with serrated edges on the leaves there is a type of elm. Now many people may say oh the elms all disappeared many years ago. This is the tree because of the Dutch elm beetle and the disease that it um, infects the tree which basically starves the life system of the tree it can't um, can't feed itself because of the disease that the beetle introduces underneath the bark and then it burrows inside the tree but there are different species of elm tree and the witch elm is one that um, is partially resistant to 
this Dutch elm disease, but this one here is in fact a smooth leaved elm. And when you get up the leaves, you can see it's still very windy today, you can feel there's a slight roughness to those leaves, but there's a nice point on the end, but there's no particular hairiness about them. Whereas the witch elm, the almost glabra, is the the one that's rather hairy. So this one we think is probably a little bit more resistant to the disease and this is quite a reasonably good sized tree actually for an elm tree. So what I'm interested in is looking out for, this is the end of May and there are a few of these seeds left. So can you see that little sort of quite leafy seed case there and on a windy day like today most of them are all blowing around which is one of the ways that elm trees can obviously propagate themselves. They are quite well known to um, propagate from suckers so you'll often find elm trees along hedgerows so you might find the common elm and the witch elm and this smooth leaved elm along various hedgerows around parts of Devon. So here we are looking at the tree now from the other side and just admiring the foliage there blowing around in the wind. Now one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in the elm is they are related to the an unusual butterfly called the white letter hair streak that it almost depends entirely on the elm for the caterpillar's food plant and what I'm here looking for right at the moment is looking for leaves that appear to have been eaten through between the veins of the leaves. So what I'm going to do now is look on the underside of the leaves and look on the underside of the twigs as well to see if I can see any larvae or any eggs of this butterfly. And if I do then I'll keep coming back here in you know the later part of the summer in in June and perhaps July and see if I can catch any of these white letter hair streak on this tree. I haven't ever found any in Oakhampton before so if I manage to find some it'll be quite exciting. So I haven't managed to find any traces of the white letter hair streak just yet but there are lots of other bugs and creatures on this tree including this green shield bug just there. So I'll leave the elm tree for now, I'll come back in the next few days and keep looking and see if there's any traces of the white letter hair streak. One more thing to say is that the, the seeds on this tree appear in May, which is very unusual for a tree of any type really, so um, every species has its own strategy for survival and this one throws its seeds out early in the year and um, they start to germinate almost straight away. So I've actually collected a few bagfuls of these seed and I'll try and grow a few but um, they're, they're very difficult to grow because you will only get a germination rate of a very few from say a thousand seeds so we'll see how they go. So a few paces later I found another interesting little creature which frequents these woods. It's called the hazel leaf roller bug or beetle. So here's your hazel tree and at this time of year you find these little cigars like that that have been made from a half of a hazel leaf and hanging there in the middle is this little rolled up section of leaf. So it's been cut really neatly maintaining the main central vein of the leaf and rolled up into this beautiful little cigar shaped structure and inside there the beetle will lay its eggs and they'll develop 
into larvae and um, hopefully become some more adult beetles. Here we've got a few of the remaining Welsh poppies looking lovely. And from here it's a good place to look at the actual structure of the woodland. What we call an ancient semi-natural woodland around this part of the country is often dominated by oak trees. These magnificent old oak trees. And um, beneath there you've got this sub-canopy, this understory of shrubby plants. So in amongst there, in front of me, there is elder and there's hawthorn and hazel and bits and pieces of holly. There's quite a bit of sycamore in there which is one of these sort of debatable naturalised plants that was introduced many hundreds of years ago. They are becoming a part of our woodland but we do have to just keep an eye on them in case they start to become dominant so they might actually then start to take over the oak woods. But this is um, it's, it's a really beautiful example of a broadleaf woodland in this part of the country with this sort of acidic soil that we have around here. A little bit further down the hill you can just about pick out a few of the remaining bluebell flowers. So May has been quite spectacular this year. And there are just a few left and they'll be back next year. I'll include a few still photos that I've taken. And then one of the great things about lockdown, there's a family walking through the woods, enjoying exploring with their dog. They just so another one of the trees in this wood is the birch. Now there are two native birch in the UK and as we work our way up always look up and then if you see the branches and the twigs are hanging down you're more likely to have the silver birch but more common in this part of the country is this one called the downy birch and the branches aren't quite so droopy and we'll come back down and when you see the bark it isn't quite a silver as the name suggests. So the downy birch gets its name from the downy leaves, they're slightly more hairy than the silver birch leaves. And here's another small shrub in the understory of this wood, sort of unassuming little plant at this time of year. Later on in the year it will have some berries on it that um, can vary between black and red and again this is another important butterfly food plant so this is the older buckthorn and early in the spring it's it's one of those really you know big signs of spring when you see this beautiful large yellow butterfly flying around in the sunny spots within the woods and that's the brimstone butterfly so this plant is absolutely key for that species and I managed to get a few good photos of brimstone butterflies earlier this year so I'll include a few of those. Here's another understory plant or shrub, the hawthorn, looking wonderful in flower, the May flower as it is May. So 
So looking at the ground level in an ancient woodland or a semi-natural ancient woodland we tend to look at the wild plants that are down there and we often refer to them as ancient woodland indicators and the soil here has been covered by ancient woodland or oak woodland for many many years many centuries and the seeds within that soil will often um, indicate that that's what this site has been for a very very long time so within there you see the little white plants that's the stitch wort and as we saw earlier there are a few bluebells left behind coming up in succession the next one through in this little patch is cow wheat in amongst the brambles there and the bracken I'm also going to have a look at this delicate little umbrella flower plant here which has got these lovely little delicate leaves I hope you can see that and so this one is the pig nut and I'm assuming it takes its name from pigs that would have or the wild boar that would have originally been wandering through these ancient woodlands snuffling about digging up things in the soil and a few inches down following the root of the pig nut down into the soil you find this little nut and it is in fact edible but um, I don't recommend digging up vast swathes of ancient woodland soil to go finding it but it, it is something that um, if it came to it and you really had to you could probably give yourself a bit of nutrition from the woodlands so this woodland the history of it is quite interesting because it was part of the the deer park that belonged to Oakhampton Castle just by pure chance there that bird box on the tree has a I think it's a blue tit nesting in it as I pointed the camera the blue tit flew out so this time of year the blue tits are nesting and raising their chicks and it's just coming up to fledging time so it's quite uh, fortuitous so at one time this woodland was open space and it's referred to as Old Town Park and people call it Town Park and it was more of a parkland at one time which was um, a landscape that maybe had a few of these large old trees in it but not so much of the understory so since those times the understory is just recovering itself and it's restoring itself back into rather a lovely semi-natural woodland So here's one of my favourite oak trees in this wood, it's just got these most wonderful curvy branches. And I think, you might be able to hear in the distance, I think that's a, a nut hatch which is nesting in a tree hole in this tree right at this moment. So if we're lucky it might come back, but I did manage to catch a few photos of local nut hatches a bit earlier in the year, so I'll include those too. I also got a lovely picture of this tree covered in snow, so I'll include that one. So holes in trees like that one that you can see there really are very important places in the habitat. So you'll get all sorts of creatures that go in there to hide and nest and shelter and roost. This wood's pretty good for various different species of bats and I'm just trying to see if those birds up in the canopy there are in fact nut hatches. There are lots of um, blue tits and marsh tits and all sorts of other little things around at the moment. And the other thing that I'm particularly interested in in this wood is the dormouse. So we know that they like to use those holes in the trees as well.
I've been monitoring the dormice in this wood along with Leo, who also lives in Oakhampton, and we have a, a license to do that. So if you see these little nest boxes on the trees, please don't touch them because it's something because of the endangered status of the dormouse, they are protected, and so we have been monitoring them here and there is a population here in this wood this part of Devon is actually quite good for dormice na nationally but um, we still need to protect this sort of habitat just to manage to maintain as many of them as we can their, their population is crashing along with many other species so here in Devon hopefully with nice woodlands like this we can hang on to this species for some time I'll show you a few photos of those dormice but in the spring in May maybe they'll be just about getting together and pairing up and starting their first litter of the season after their hibernation and we'll keep a check on them and you may find that they possibly if it's a good year have another litter later in the year as well So this little open glade here, where the sunshine's coming in, is what's known as an acid flush or a, a wet flush. There are lots of springs popping up out of the ground in this part of the wood and this is an interesting little habitat. And within there is a Heath spotted orchid, which is quite an unusual one, not flowering at the moment. But one of the problems with this wood and the way woods are managed these days is that before we started enclosing land and putting up fences, the natural range of species here would have included some large grazing animals, so ponies and probably a few cattle and they would have kept areas like this open. So without those large herbivores, this area is becoming a little more enclosed now and the willow at the side there, the brackens in front of us, sorry, the brambles and the, and the bracken is, is overwhelming this wet flush area. So what humans will have to do is take that role of being these large herbivores and come in with some cutting tools. So at some point we'll try and do a couple of volunteer work party days and come in and cut out these trees because this is about maintaining that balance and that diversity that we need to keep the required wildlife of all different types. You won't be able to see it from here, but I can see one or two dragonflies and a few birds hopping around. But if we're not careful, the woodland will take over this whole area. So we need to keep an eye on it. So this will be my last shot of the day. The battery in this camera is running out, so I'll go home and charge it up again, come back tomorrow. So here's the river, beautiful river. It's very low at the moment. Earlier in the year, we had a couple of months, almost intense rain, and this river was very high. And then since then, it's been really quite dry, so you can see a lot more stone than river there just at the moment. This river is, as they say, a, a, a real lifeblood of the woods though and um, living amongst the stones all year round you have the, the larvae of all these insects and the, the fish that live amongst the, the pebbles in the bottom of the river. So there's probably small brown trout and small other fish like bullheads in the river there. 
one of the big interests for me is when you see a rock like that one you can see it's rather worn on the top the the moss that's growing on the rock is a bit worn away and a bit brown so that's a, a good sign that otters come by on this river and they run over that rock and mark it with their sprint so um, being a little bit obsessed with what clues animals leave behind I've got numerous pictures of otter sprint that um, that you can look at and you can work out what they've been eating and they're often full of bits of bones from brown trout and from bullhead fish and frogs and um, all sorts of other bits and pieces and just up above us there there's the castle walls and the bluebells I think you can just see in the meadow across there and there goes the river heading down towards the town I don't know whether it's possible to see on this video but you can see swarms of tiny insects there and these are all the little flies that are hatching out that have spent the whole of the winter down in the riverbed there's larvae and they're all hatching out now so they make lovely food for the birds and the fish and that's where life starts down in the riverbed in this instance So while my battery's still fading away but hanging on, here we are at the meadow at the bottom of the wood, just by the bridge over towards the castle. And his lovers meet, which is obviously a favourite place for many of Oakhampton's children of all ages to come here and enjoy the river. It's a great place to come in the evening, you can see a number of bats flying around. So if you see the one that skims the water surface just before it gets dark, that's the Dorbenton's bat, so it'll be catching bugs and flies just above the water surface. So here at the side on the right there is a big clump of nettles which is a very important bit of the diversity of the habitat. I often take many photos of butterflies and going further to the right there here we have the willow so as it turns into the scrubby woodland edge then we have elder and a few other shrubs in there so this whole mix together creates a really good little woodland habitat and a great place for us as well as we approach this patch of nettles it becomes clear that it's full of life there's some kind of little lace wing there a little tiny pollinating fly of some sort there the world of insects is a bit wide and varied so um, I've got a long way to go to learn how to identify them all but it's good fun trying there's one bug over here that I'll be taking a few photos of and trying to identify it when I get home Looks a bit like some kind of soldier beetle, something like that, but um, I'll have a little 
look around when I get home to see if I can work out what that one is. And it's an interesting little spider, if you like that kind of thing. So this one's almost white. Kind of a crab spider and it's sitting there waiting to ambush its prey. Some of those crab spiders after a few days they can change colour to almost match the background colour of, of the plant that they're waiting on and I've seen them various shades of green and yellow and they're the same species but that's obviously white at the moment. Then on the other side of this patch of nettles you come across this little pink flower. Very pretty little flower. It's actually an introduced species but not one that's seriously becoming too much of a problem. As in some of the other in introduced or invasive species do become properly invasive but this one just seems to have found its niche without taking over too much so personally I'm quite pleased to see it and you know other, other people are in a long debate about whether all these things should be eradicated but certain things become part of the wildlife of our country and um, this is one of them that I quite like. Just to demonstrate the value of a patch of brambles and nettles, just leaving and on my way home for today I'll come back again tomorrow but in these nettles somewhere down there we find caterpillars munching away on the nettles so But I often find comma butterflies and peacock, all sorts of things. And then a bit later in the year all that bramble will come into its own. It's already flowered and so the, the pollinators have had a great time in spring taking the nectar off all the flowers but later in the year obviously it's when humans get interested in them as well. And hopefully we'll get a good crop of berries which is where the birds, the insects, the small mammals, they can all have a good feed as well. So, time to go today. And we'll do a bit more when I've recharged the battery.